Mic check one two, mic two, mic check one two, one two. Mic check one two, mic check one two.
Mic check one two, mic check one two.
Mic check one two. You got it.
I'm going to start in a minute. We're just waiting, and he's here. He's in the building, uh, Congressman Chris Smith. He will be here as well. You're also going to hear them speak. We're very fortunate today to have Congressman Scott Perry, who came from Western Pennsylvania. <laughs> Congressman Dr. Andy Harris, who came from Maryland. And here's Chris now. He's probably studying. Because he always knows what he's talking about. So just a few words before we start. You're, you're going to notice that this is a more formalized meeting. In other words, this is a congressional investigatory meeting, uh, which I'm going to chair, and we're going to go through a certain process. We have witnesses, and these are witnesses that are experts in their field, and they are going to speak to the different areas of what's happening and going on, all the way from the economy to the environment to tourism and, uh, you know, the gamut, the full gamut. And they're all in front, and they will all be introduced to you as we go along. Um, it's not a town meeting, and I love town meetings because I love being out there with you yelling and screaming because of what's happening, but this is going to be formalized, and this is sort of a time to listen and to learn for all of us, including us. Uh, so it's going to be very methodical. Um, I'm going to ask everybody not to, not microphones, they drive me nuts. I'm going to ask everybody not to yell or scream or do anything of that nature, whether you agree or disagree, however you feel. We just want to listen and we want to learn um, and not to do anything untoward or inappropriate. Um, if something is done inappropriate, quite frankly, we have a large police presence here and that person will be removed because it isn't fair for everybody else who are basically here to, tr to try to learn and understand what's happening and um, we're, we're going to look at the budget and see if we can get the Wildwood Convention Center some microphones. Um, we're going to start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to ask everybody to rise. The flag is all the way behind you in the back. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The chair is now going to recognize himself for five minutes for an opening statement. Good afternoon, and I want to thank you all for joining us here today for the launch of a congressional investigation into offshore wind, and we call it offshore wind industrialization. The purpose of this investigation is to develop a comprehensive legislative solution for the disruptive of offshore wind. The leasing, development, and operation of industrial offshore wind structures should have a fair process that transparently and proactively involves all, and I'm going to use that word again, all, everyone, affected communities, industries, and stakeholders. Right now, that process is sorely lacking and underserving. If offshore wind industrialization moves forward, it will be the most profound transformation of the Atlantic coast in the history of the United States of America. And again, I want everybody to really understand that the most profound transformation of the Atlantic coast and other areas, by the way, not just the Atlantic coast, in the history of the United States of America. 
That's a big statement. Developers want to build thousands of Eiffel Tower-sized turbines that will line our horizons for decades. Despite the gravity of this undertaking, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has engaged in a rushed and sloppy project and a sloppy approval process. We're going to wait till that quiets down a little bit. That door probably shouldn't be used because it's noisy. Yeah. As we speak, the Atlantic coast is being used as a testing ground for the eventual national implementation of offshore wind. From communities to stakeholders, it is hard to find a group that feels as though their thoughts and suggestions have been properly examined and or addressed by offshore wind companies or our state and our local governments. The truth is that our government is acting more in the interest of the rich and powerful than in the interest of our people, of our Americans. It's our goal today to evaluate and correct this deeply, profoundly unfair process. The first phase of our investigation will focus on identifying the potential negative impacts of offshore wind industrialization. This includes potential long-term environmental impacts to areas in and around industrial offshore wind turbines, impacts on local economics, impacts on maritime travel, safety, and rescue operations and impacts on our national defense and our radar capabilities. I sincerely and truly wish that it were not necessary for Congress to investigate this matter. Unfortunately, neither the federal government nor the companies behind these projects have been responsive to the local communities. I have invited Orsted to testify today. I invited because we want to hear all the we want to hear their answers, and I wanted them to provide a transparent accounting for their project. I wanted my congressman here to be able to ask them questions. Orsted rejected the opportunity to appear. So, and they rejected the opportunity to appear and explain their process to us and to all of you at home and all of you who are watching. Orsted believes that their current so-called public process has provided a comprehensive record of these projects. Now I'm going to tell you, you know, I will have an editorial comment on that. That is a joke. You know that I say what I mean. Uh, they never interacted with our communities, never interacted with our fishermen, never interacted with our tourism people, never interacted with economists, local or other. As someone deeply involved in the affairs of South Jersey, and by the way, here's the Orsted letter, and I am asked that it's going to be entered into the record without objection. Orsted believes that their current so-called public process has provided this comprehensive record. As someone deeply involved, again, I don't believe that's true. It's not surprising that offshore wind companies feel so comfortable avoiding public scrutiny. They have the full, unconditional support of this current administration. So because offshore wind companies and the Biden administration refuse to share the facts with the American people, and I'll also say the Murphy administration, Congress must do its job. So let me just go through a few facts. The the first, a microphone's going to kill me. <laughs> the first fact is that these projects are massive. 
Currently, nearly 2 million acres, or 2,656 square miles. 2 million acres. Think of that, how big this project. Have been leased in the Atlantic, with millions more to come. These turbines will dig hundreds of feet into the ocean floor and rise 900 feet above the ocean surface. They will require hundreds of miles of seafloor dredging in order to bury transmission cables under the seafloor. Just picture this. The second fact is that these projects have massive environmental, operational, safety, and security implications for the United States of America. That's why we have gathered a panel of witnesses with experience in each of these areas. Our witnesses will speak to their personal experiences in dealing with the government and offshore wind companies through this backwards approval process that you've all witnessed. They will establish how current offshore wind activities are disrupting wildlife and how negative impacts on the environment will only expand if the process continues. They will express concerns over how their communities will lose billions of dollars of revenue from the local economies and business. They will speak on how suggested turbine layout designs to better accommodate maritime vessel traffic have been rejected and that dangerous boat collisions with industrial offshore wind grids are inevitable. We'll testify to how wind turbines interfere significantly with radar systems used by vessels of all sizes. They will explain how these projects are an unaffordable wealth transfer from American taxpayers and ratepayers into the pockets of wealthy energy industrialists who aren't even in America. Our energy is going to be controlled by the rest of the world. They will show that offshore wind companies and their partners in the federal government are not acting in accordance with the will of the American people. Already, people are waking up to the devastating truth of industrial offshore wind. I submit to the record this resolution from the National Congress of American Indians, which calls for the deaths for the Department of Interior and bomb, to quote, halt all scoping and permitting for offshore wind projects in completion of a com comprehensive and transparent procedure adequately protecting tribal environmental and sovereign interests is developed. And I will enter, ask this to be entered into the record without objection. I would also like to submit that these two letters to the record, one from Democrat, Democrat Senator Jeff Merkley, the other from Democrat Senator Ron Wyden, and former Democrat House member Peter DeFazio, who was a chairman of transportation infrastructure in his time, both to bomb, stating their concerns of offshore wind will have on West Coast communities and on industries of all kinds. Our concerns, our concerns are not a Republican or Democratic problem. All sides have felt some level of unease over these projects, if the truth be told. It is time. It is time we examine the process and find ways to guarantee maximum transparency and fairness when it comes to the implementation of offshore wind and energy. With that, I yield, and I now recognize Representative Chris Smith for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And a special thanks on behalf of all of us to Chairman Jeff Van Drew 
for convening this extremely important and timely congressional field hearing. Like the canary in the coal mine, the recent spate of tragic whale deaths has brought new light and increased scrutiny to the fast tracking of thousands of wind turbines off our coast. Cindy Siff, executive director of the Ocean Clean, Clean Ocean Action, points out in her testimony that the National Marine Fisheries Service has said, and I quote, offshore wind is a new use of our marine waters requiring substantial scientific and regulatory review. Then she asks, where's the substantial review? Nowhere to be found. All of us up here believe serious, aggressive, and independent analysis of the ocean altering impact of these projects uh, is so egregious that they must be at the very least. The wind farms approval process has been shoddy at best, leaving unaddressed and unanswered numerous serious questions concerning the extraordinarily harmful environmental impact on marine life and the ecosystems that allow all of our sea creatures current day, great and small, to thrive. In like manner, the devastating impact on commercial and recreational fishing is largely ignored. And I've read, like all of you on, the, on this panel, I've read the environmental impact statements. I've read two so far and have not been impressed uh, by them. And of course, one of our wonderful witnesses today, Megan Lapp, will say, we are facing the annihilation of our industry at the hands of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, close quote. New Jersey's amazing shore tourism is also being put at grave risk Dr. Bob Stern will testify about the harmful effect of noise to whales, but then he brings out something none of us is really focused on, the impact on us. We're going to hear those things, and it's not good. I look forward to his testimony. We all know that during the construction phase, pile driving thousand foot poles into the seabed will cause catastrophic noise levels, but that's only the beginning. What about the airborne noise to us? And again, Thank you, Dr. Stern, for doing that. Offshore wind farms, especially the size of the one that Governor Murphy bonds and President Biden are forcing on us, and this is using the coercive power of the state. They're not listening to any of us, at least not yet. They're using all of that power to say, take her to leave it. You have to take it. The vulnerability of massive structures the size of the Chrysler Building to hurricanes, nor'easters, and superstorms has not been adequately investigated and vetted. One Carnegie Mellon, uh, Mellon study in 2012 found that there is, quote, a very substantial risk that a Category 3 higher or higher hurricane can destroy half or more of the turbines at some locations, close quote. Imagine a thousand foot poles with all of that on the top, like dominoes falling into the sea. Any surface appeal industry or government comparison to the survivability of ocean wind turbines, turbines uh, on the east coast of the United States to the UK or Norway omits the fact that the UK and Europe don't get hurricanes. They get remnants from ours, but they're not known for getting hurricanes as we are. Bloomberg did an article in January and pointed out that Osted was saying uh, that they had asked that vessel traffic be stopped in Norway for a time because one of their blades fell into the water. These things happen, and then there was a also in that article, there's no publicly available industry-wide data on turbine failures. Vessel navigation, including U.S. Navy ships, merchant ships, and search and rescue operations. Again, great kudos to Ms. Lapp for bringing all of this out so well, including operations by the Coast Guard. They do about 1,000 search and rescues, both North and South Jersey, a year. Their radars will be compromised. The National Academy of Sciences and uh, Engineering and Medicine released a report in 2022, that's a recent report, called Wind Turbine Generation Impacts on Marine Vessel Radar, and found that wind turbine generators obfuscate the marine vessel radar for both magnetron-based and solid-state radar, and could cause significant interference and shadowing that suppress the detection of small contacts. We're looking at vessels colliding. You know, I represent Earl where so much of our munitions go out to sea from the Earl base by sea. What, what will this do to their radars? The study also found that wind turbine, this is a quote, mitigation techniques for marine vessel radar have not been substantially investigated, implemented, matured, or deployed. Where is that in all of this push by the governor and by Biden? 
people of New Jersey deserve better. Local control ought to be listened to. Local input, it is being completely dissed uh, by, and 30 mayors, including Paul Kanitra, who's here from Point Pleasant, have all spoken out so strongly, and they're being told, we don't care what you think, we're just gonna do it. Now, let me just ask you, say one final thing. Why the rush to get it all done? Could it be the massive time-sensitive build-it-now taxpayer subsidies that you're paying for and I from the Biden administration? The misnamed Inflation Reduction Act, which all of my Republican colleagues and I voted against, includes a 30% tax credit for offshore wind projects. And here, catch this, that begin instruction before January 1st, 2026. So they're saying, the heck with all the environmental review. We want to get that money, we want to build these things, we want to do it now. I've introduced legislation, co-sponsored by all of my colleagues, to get the GAO, General Accountability Office, or Government Accountability Office, to look at all of this, to do an overview of how poorly, in my opinion, they have done their environmental reviews, and we're going to get that passed, we're going to get it into law, and we're going to have that review. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for doing this. It's going to make a difference. Congressman Smith yields, and the chair now recognizes Congressman Dr. Harris of the great state of Maryland for his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Van Buren, for uh, your tenacity on this issue. Uh, your and Congressman Smith's opening remarks well summarize this issue at hand. I also want to thank you for inviting me to this field hearing. I represent Maryland's Atlantic Coast, where we have two major wind projects planned and proposed. Now, our districts share the Atlantic Coast, but I'll tell you, our whales don't stop at state borders. They don't recognize state borders, and neither do we on this issue. I've had the... <laughs> and by the way, I want to thank you all for participating in democracy today. This is what democracy looks like. I want to thank the witnesses who are here today speaking scientific truth to power. I've been involved with this issue for over six years now. In fact, several years ago, I tried to get NOAA to investigate the effects of offshore wind energy on fisheries and marine mammals. We could have done this years ago, but apparently the federal government didn't want to do it. The fix was in. It's become clear that federal regulatory agencies have a clear agenda on this issue. But this country is not made up of regulatory agencies. It's made up of the American people, like you. People whose voice is much more important than regulatory agencies and foreign-owned companies. I'll be brief because we're here to hear from the experts, so I look forward to hearing from them. Again, I thank you, Mr. Van Drew, for holding this important congressional field hearing, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman. We appreciate your presence here. Um, you know, and it's interesting with these federal agencies, just, just, just food for thought, up in New England, when one whale died a little while back, there was discussion by the federal government of completely closing down the lobster industry. One whale. But when it comes to this, dozens have died, and there's no interest in figuring out what's really going on at all. Again, it's food for thought. It's always the little guy that's taking it by the short end. Okay, um, Congressman Dr. Harris yields, and the chairman now recognizes Mr. Perry for his opening statements. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Van Drew. Thank you all. Um, and thanks for putting this hearing together. Look, th this is happening in your town here, but the rest of the country is watching. The rest of the world is watching. Uh, by my count, what I've got here, 23 dead whales have washed ashore on the East Coast. And look, we want to be good stewards. Of, of the environment, of the ocean, of the world we live in, and, and, and we have to take stock of what we see. There's a reason these things are happening. Now, I get that the administration wants to rush this forward and, and have this stuff built. They, they made a press release. They made promises. You know, good for them. But this is your town. This is our country. 
and we're, we're in charge here, right? You're in charge here. That's what you're doing here today. Um, you know, I'm concerned that it says the impact, about the impact on the North Atlantic right whale. Um, and, and they've already allowed for a 10% decrease in the population just by this, this construction. I, I'm not sure who these folks are, uh, but, I, but I know that the folks in this town don't support any of that. And, and certainly, we are very, very concerned about the world we live in, but it also includes what we're paying here. This is going to cost people in New Jersey three times, three times what it would cost otherwise to produce this power. It's, it, from the math that I did quickly, based on the figures I saw here, $11 billion additional. Look, the lights are on right now without these wind turbines out in the ocean turning, screwing up your fisheries, the, D the Department of Defense is concerned your industry is concerned, whether it's tourism or otherwise, and the administration is moving forward and subverting all the policies and the processes that they would force you. If you wanted to go out and build a shed in your backyard here, I guarantee you, somebody's going to stop over, right? You're just not going to put it up yet. Yet they're telling you, they're telling you, oh, well, you know, we don't have to follow any of this stuff. We're, we're from the federal government and we're here to help, okay? Well, look, this town, this state, this country is not run by special interests and folks that never saw the New Jersey shore from Washington, D.C. This town and this operation will be determined by the people that live here. I thank the gentleman for allowing me to come. God bless you. I yield back the balance. So Mr. Perry yields, and we will now introduce today's witnesses. Cindy Ziff the Executive Director of Clean Ocean Action. <laughs> Dr. Bob Stern, who is the former Director of the Office of Environmental Com Compliance at the United States Department of Energy and current President of Save LBI. Judge Michael Donahue, a former New Jersey Superior Court judge. <laughs> Daniel Lavecchia, the owner of La Monica Fine Foods. <laughs> Megan Lapp, a representative for Sea Freeze Limited, which is the largest producer and trader of sea frozen seafood on the United, Sto on the United States. East Coast. <laughs> David Stevenson, who is the director of the Center for Energy Competitiveness for the Caesar Rodney Institute. <laughs> we thank our witnesses for coming today, and we will begin by swearing you in. We, will you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that this testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and beliefs, so help you God? Okay. The record will reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. You can sit down. Um, please be seated. Uh, please know that your written testimony, now this is important, people who have written, this, written testimony here today they can submit it for the record, and it will be in the congressional record. So their testimony will all be in the congressional record. But if you have something that you want to submit for or against, feel free to come up, reach one of our staff people, and that will be submitted without objection uh, and to, for the record, to the record. So, Ms. Ziff, you have the honor of going first, and you are now recognized. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you very, very much for holding this important hearing on offshore wind development in the region, and also to Representative Smith, Harris, and Perry for attending. Having the focus of congressional leaders is such a breath of fresh air and most welcome to provide much needed attention to the recent unprecedented death of marine mammals and the ocean industrialization that is underway off our coast. And I also want to thank 
all of you for being here today. We know what the power of the people can do. My name is Cindy Ziff, and I am Executive Director of Clean Ocean Action. Our name is our mission. We advocate for a clean and healthy ocean with action, and for nearly 40 years, we've stood together with all of you. We've stood together with strong bipartisan support and thousands of citizens, and we've stopped ocean dumping, blocked many, many, many fossil fuel projects, and brought the ocean in this region back from the brink of collapse. Together, after hard work for decades with many people in this room, including longtime support of Representatives Van Drew and Smith, the ocean off the Jersey Shore is now thriving with marine life. And we must keep it that way. It is important to say from the outset that Clean Ocean Action is not opposed to renewable energy, particularly on land, where it is cheaper and easier than um, to maintain. Clean Ocean Action is also open to the idea of some offshore wind, but only should a pilot scale project be proven successful and the science is there to support industrial scale power plants while protecting the ocean. Make no mistake, the living resources on the planet are in crisis. Climate change is real and Clean Ocean Action concurs with the United Nation, United, UN Environment Program that calls for a reduction in, green, in greenhouse gas emissions, 30% by 2030. Reducing fossil fuel is critical toward this goal. It is also important to note the ocean is our best buffer to climate change by absorbing nearly 90% of all the heat we've been pumping in and over 50% of the CO2. Now, while some offshore wind may hold promise, federal and state agencies have moved forward without public transparency, robust and sound science, and good, go and good governance. According to the National Marine Fisheries Service, by 2030, offshore wind power plants, as you said, Congressman, will cover up to 2.4 million acres of seafloor with 3,400 turbines requiring 10,000 miles of cable with an additional 5.7 million acres under further consideration. This is too much too fast, and in a word, simply reckless. Marine life is being placed at grave risk without scientific due diligence, monitoring, and protection to ensure the ocean survives this massive industrialization. Indeed, the ocean and the coast will be vastly transformed and industrialized, and the public would still likely be in the dark if it weren't for the outrageously grim and tragic number of whale and dolphin deaths. Since December, 12 whales have washed up on the beaches just of New York and New Jersey. These innocent gentle giants are now buried on our beaches or dumped in a landfill. Marine mammals are important and protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. They are revered by the public, which was evident when nearly 1,000 people attended the World Whale Day rally in Point Pleasant which was organized by concerned citizens Leslie Mangold and Tricia DeVoe. As we know, some whales are close to extinction. Most at risk is the North Atlantic right whale, which is on the brink, and the Endangered Species Act was enacted to protect these species. Under these laws, the government must protect marine mammals, yet permission is given to harass. This permission is called takes, which are issued by the National Marine Fisheries Service incidental take authorizations. Offshore wind has many threats to marine life. In fact, the National Marine Fisheries Service says offshore wind can, and I quote, increase ocean noise, which can affect the behavior of fish, whales, and other species, introduce electromagnetic fields that can impact navigation, predator detection, communication, and the ability for fish and shellfish to find mates, Exchange, habitat, ex change existing habitats by altering local or regional hydrodynamics, read uh, the cold pool or the thermocline, create a reef effect where marine life cluster around hard surfaces of wind developments, impact organism life cycle stages, including larval dis dispersal and spawning, change species composition, abundance, distribution, and survival rates, release contaminants that can be consumed or absorbed by marine life. And this last one, 
I should emphasize increased vessel traffic, which could lead to more vessel strikes. What a list. National Marine Fisheries Service knows offshore wind is harmful. They conclude with, as Congressman Smith said, offshore wind is a new use of the ocean which requires substantial scientific and regulatory review. We agree. So where is this substantial review? Where is also the, caution, the commitment to the precautionary principle? With that said, in January, with whale number five on the beach, Clean Ocean Action was deeply concerned by the unprecedented whale deaths and began to investigate. Kari Martin, Clean Ocean Action's advocacy campaign manager, totaled up all the marine takes that were issued. In, 11, uh, in all, a, an unprecedented 11 companies were authorized to take a total of 63,820 marine mammals just off the Jersey and New York coast. These were what call, is called level B takes, which allows for the potential to disturb animals, mammals, including, but not limited to, migration, breathing, nursing, breeding, feeding, and sheltering, all which are required for life. Now, in less than three months, we're up to 12 dead whales that we know of, and, and many dolphins, and many other, and many dolphins as well, including one just yesterday. It is important to note that these uh, allowed harassments numbers are only for, quote, pre-construction activities for the multiple offshore wind projects. The much louder construction, much, much louder construction activities that prompt more, level, more severe takes and higher numbers of impacted animals are next. Clean Ocean Action continues to assert that these deaths of dolphins could be plausibly caused by the survey work. In January, Clean Ocean Action, with the support of additional groups, called on President Biden to conduct an independent, uh, a transparent and independent scientific investigation and pause this uh, offshore wind pre-construction activity. While there is much in the media of the agencies insisting there is no connection between offshore wind and these deaths. Given the list I just read and how significant the potential is for harm, why wouldn't it be plausible? Where is the evidence to prove that there is no connection? COA has additional evidence that there were at least six survey vessels with clo within close proximity with each other off the Atlantic and Cape May counties conducting sonar and other geotechnical activities. These could have caused cumulative effects with these multiple sonar activities. In fact, since December, offshore wind surveying, which consists of the intense back and forth erratic activity of these survey boats, has increased. And I do also want to note that large commerce shipping to the port decreased by 20%. So offshore wind activity increased, large ship activity decreased. Why is there such an immediate rejection and defensive response to offshore wind as a plausible cause? There does not to be, there has not been any in-depth federal assessment, just denials. Clean Ocean Action continues to call for the investigation. However, access to information is difficult and we hope that the members of Congress may be able to help us. We need to get access to the automated identifi identification system data for all the ships engaged in offshore wind activities. We want reports from the survey boats, necropsy reports, acoustic buoy data. We need to have all this information. If the federal government isn't going to do the research, we must. There is, there is strong support for action and concern. And launched on World, Water Day, World Whale Day, over 300,000 people have signed COA's petition for the investigation into these marine deaths and a pause to this reckless fast tracking. It seems our government is at best putting the cart before the horse and wants to view offshore wind while only wearing green colored glasses. Our ocean deserves better. We must save our ocean. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. <laughs> Shields back. Uh, 
and just to remind everybody in the audience how this goes, everybody will speak and then the Congress people will ask them questions. So we're going to go through all the speakers first, as it is done in Washington. Uh, next, I'm going to ask Dr. Bob Stern to make his remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and committee members for the opportunity to present a very important problem regarding the offshore wind problems. Uh, my name is Bob Stern. I have a background in math and engineering. Uh, I previously managed the office that oversaw environmental reviews uh, within the Department of Energy. Uh, and in that capacity, uh, our office reviewed and recommended approval or disapproval of the environmental impact statements for that department. Uh, along the way, uh, we also encountered many environmental issues regarding other statutes uh, like the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act and the Coastal Zone Management Act. So uh, while my wife says I know everything, which i kind of not sure she's serious, uh, one thing I think I do know is when we're seeing uh, good environmental reviews and when we're not and I think the congressmen have already expressed the truth about that. Uh, I currently uh, am heading the Save LBI group. Uh, we are a group now of about 5,000 supporters. Uh, we are not necessarily opposed to all offshore wind energy, uh, but we are very adamantly opposed uh, to what we see as an ill-informed uh, biased, and I, I hate to use that word, um, decision-making process uh, and uh, what that has resulted in, which is specific projects uh, in locations that will obviously cause way more harm uh, than good. I'd like to focus on just one topic today, and that is noise, uh, noise to the whales, and uh, unfortunately, uh, potential noise to we humans as well. Uh, the whales, as you know, rely on noise for just about everything. Uh, communication, navigation, uh, sensing danger, which could include oncoming ships, uh, finding food. If the noise is, is loud enough, it can directly damage their hearing organs um, but that's not what we think is occurring here with respect to the vessel surveys, and I'll come back to this a little later. Uh, that requires kind of very high levels for that to occur. Uh, but what we think is, is happening here is what the law calls uh, disturbance of the whale's behavior, and that can cause uh, other things to happen. For example, uh, a mother and calf could be uh, swimming along. They communicate by sound, not by sight. And so if they encounter noise levels that override their communications, then the calf gets separated and, and need I say more. Um, and this also, uh, this disturbance level noise can also cause whales to surface uh, with the, the noise level at the surface is less. Um, so they will try to avoid the noise, uh, but while doing that, they've lost their navigational uh, senses and they become more vulnerable to vessel strike. So while the word disturbance, which is in the law, you know, may sound a little innocuous, uh, it is not, it is not. And that's what we believe we're encountering here with these vessel surveys and other activities, and we can go into that more. Um, since December, uh, just on the Jersey coast, uh, we've encountered nine whale strandings in a three-month period. Uh, the annual average is seven. So we've seen nine in three months, which is obviously an unusual spike in the number of whale strandings. And the only, just looking at this logically, the only difference offshore recently uh, has been now the presence of five to six vessel surveys out there uh, that use high intensity noise equipment uh, to characterize the seabed. Uh, and they are out there simultaneously going over pretty much the same area 
exposing the whales to, to noise levels. And this uh, is not a new issue for us. We raised the concern about the vessel surveys over a year ago when the marine fisheries people were considering approval of these uh, surveys. And we commented then, and we stick to our comments now, that they were significantly underestimating the vessel's impact. And it gets to various technical assumptions they were making, uh, which we believe were just wrong. And we commented three or four times, we met with marine fishery staff, and the comments were basically ignored. So this is not a new issue uh, that we just raised recently to some accusing us of just trying to use the issue to create alarm. That's not the case. This is a long-standing concern uh, that we have had with the way the process is proceeding. So you, you put those two things together. <laughs> oh, I guess uh, we have a few more enemies out there. Right? <laughs> you, you put the two things together, the presence of the vessels, the noise levels that we believe uh, they cause, it does not take a rocket scientist to come to the conclusion that that is a potential cause of what's going on. And I think any responsible person agency uh, would jump at the opportunity to investigate this and see what it is. And if the agencies are so confident that this is not the cause, then fine, let's put it on the table. Let's look at other causes they present and let's figure it out. Uh, but to just brush it off uh, seems to us to be uh, just irresponsible. Um, unfortunately, uh, the vessel surveys, uh, as Cindy alluded to, are probably just the start of worse noise impacts uh, to the whales and to other uh, marine uh, mammals. Uh, the pile driving that's associated with the construction activities is a significant noisy effort. Uh, you're basically pile driving a 50 foot diameter steel object into the seabed uh, that takes multiple strikes it, is, it gives off an intense noise, and that process is, goes on for several years. And, and the noise levels there are probably more intense than the noise levels that we're seeing with the vessel surveys. And then the worst problem of all, we believe, is coming from the operation of these turbines. The turbines today, as you know, have exploded in size over the last several years. When we were talking about six megawatt turbines, eight megawatt turbines four or five years ago, the noise from operation was not so bad. But there is a clear trend, and it has been documented, that the larger the turbine gets, the noisier it gets at its source. And so we looked at this, we did some estimates. They showed that the noise from the operation was going to permeate out to very large distances before it dropped down to a safe level. Knowing that the powers that be would not believe us, we hired an acoustics company uh, to look at the full project off LBI, do their own analysis, and they basically confirmed what we did and their results were worse. And what it showed was that the noise from the operation would extend out from shore 93 miles. That's how significant this gets. And then we looked at the migration of the right whale, which of course you all know about now and, and are concerned with. And we found that the right whale has according to the data from everywhere we could look, has never migrated further out than 86 miles. So if you've got sort of this noise barrier extending out 93 miles, and the right whale migrates within 86 miles, 
And these noise levels are such that the whale's first reaction is to avoid it. So you've got a whale trying to migrate and encountering this, this essential wall of noise, and obviously it's, it's putting its migration in jeopardy. We've raised this issue as well with the federal agencies for over a year to at least address the operational noise issue. They are ignoring it. They completely ignore it in any of the documentation we've seen so far. And I think the implications are obvious because they know that they have selected a number of these wind energy areas right in the path of this critically endangered whale, which, to put it mildly, is not intelligent. And so they're worried about the implications of this to the program. And that caused us to basically write a letter to the president about two weeks ago, which I'd like to enter into the record if that's acceptable, and trying to bring this to the president's attention, that this is a serious problem. It involves the survival of a critically endangered whale. And your agencies, again, to put it mildly, have not done a great job. So please consider this, step into this, and maybe you can alter uh, or change some direction in the way these wind energy areas have been selected. And so we hope the administration takes it seriously. Uh, the operational issue, in our view, is probably the worst of, of the issues where the whales are going to face. So, finally, uh, noise. <laughs> noise to us. Uh, will we hear these turbines uh, at the shore? And the turbine manufacturer uh, gives a noise source level uh, for the uh, Vesta 236 turbine, which is what they're proposing off LBI. And at the source, the manufacturer says it'll be 118 decibels at the source. Uh, that's loud. That's noisy. And then we looked at uh, how would this noise dissipate over water, which is what's happening. And as you know, uh, noise travels much better uh, over water uh, than it does over land. If you've ever been across a lake, you, you can probably hear some noisy neighbors even a half a mile away. So we did our own estimates, and we concluded that the noise level at the shore was going to be above the ambient level or the normal level at the shore and very close to the New Jersey nighttime residential standard of 50 decibels. But that, again, we wanted to have a professional company look at it. We've engaged that same acoustics company, and as we speak, uh, they're looking at the issue again. And we'll be glad to report back to you on the results. But at this point, I believe it's certainly fair to say that these levels are these the the pro at least the project off LBI, uh, which is very, as you know, very close to shore, nine miles offshore, that the noise from the operation will be audible. So, you know, let's, let's reflect a little bit on what we're doing here. Uh, we're looking at hundreds of thousand foot tall structures, nine to 15 miles offshore, they will be clearly visible, no matter what other diversions you might have heard about being barely visible or rarely visible. That is entirely false. They will be clearly visible all the time. Uh, we also put up on our website an animation of the turbines, the rotation of the blades, which you have not seen. All you've seen are static images. And, you know, maybe it's me, but I can't look at these rotating blades for more than five or six seconds. I have to turn away. So you've got that effect. You're also going to see a reduced breeze at the shore because the wind turbines are basically extracting a good part of the energy that normally would flow to the shore. 
And with that, you're going to see higher local temperature and higher humidity. So if you put all this together, all these visible effects and then audible noise at the shore, you know, I would suggest to you that we're not just facing some, you know, mild reduction in the shore experience or some mild change. You're looking at basically the destruction of the shore experience. And, and with that, And, and with that, as you know, and others will speak to, uh, not just comes the, the aesthetic loss of the experience, but it's going to come with significant environmental effects on the shore community, which others uh, will speak to. So just in closing again, I, I would also like to very much uh, thank the committee uh, for your interest. Uh, it's, it's frankly been a little lonely on LBI uh, just trying to speak some truth and what we think are some facts to people and uh, not having them listen. Uh, but with your interest and with the support, you know, we see behind us, uh, we don't feel so lonely anymore. So thank you very much. Dr. Stern yields back, thank you. And next we have Judge Michael Donahue. I will remind everybody, gosh, we could do this. There's so much going on, uh, but we're gonna try to stick. Usually it's five minutes. I'm trying to stick to under 10 minutes if we can. And it's hard to do, I realize it. Believe me, uh, I love to talk. And there's so much information here, but um, just try to do your best. We would appreciate it, thank you. Judge Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I got the same mic as you, Congressman. <laughs> um, we want to thank, obviously, Representatives Harris, Smith, Perry for helping to bring the House of Representatives to Cape May County. Uh, it's an extraordinary event, and we all understand how important it is. And we most especially want to thank our Congressman Jeff Van Drew for his tireless efforts in addressing the concerns we all have about offshore wind industrialization. Thank you, Chairman. I have been an attorney for nearly 30 years. I'm a former New Jersey Superior Court judge. I represent the County of Cape May as special counsel on the wind issues. While there are dozens of serious issues of concern, including impacts on fisheries and marine life, among many other things, I'm here to touch on home rule and tourism. At the outset, it's important to state that the County of Cape May is not opposed to cleaner energy. And as a coastal county is more concerned about the potential impacts of warming and, and rising oceans than most communities. But the county believes that the installation of offshore wind projects must take local concerns and local impacts into more serious consideration. In June of 2021, an amendment to the New Jersey Offshore Wind Economic Development Act, OWEDA, was introduced. The bill started in the New Jersey Senate on June 10th, 2021, and it was passed through the entire state legislature in just 14 days. 10 business days. Extraordinary. As a result of this amendment to OWEDA, any municipality or county in the state of New Jersey that refuses to acquiesce to the demands of a qualified offshore wind project is subject to having their authority as elected officials transferred to the unelected New Jersey Board of Public Utilities. <laughs> Local and county elected officials are pushed aside. Home rule is eliminated. Local control and influence is gutted. Throughout 2022, both the city of Ocean City, New Jersey, and the county of Cape May were pulled into litigation before the BPU by separate petitions filed by the Orsted Ocean Wind One project. The county and the city vigorously opposed those petitions. We are the first to stand and offer legal arguments against the advancement of these projects. <clears throat> The BPU, the BPU refused to afford the city and the county the due process protections that the New Jersey Eminent Domain Act 
requires related to the takings of real property. They specifically denied that that applied. The BPU refused to allow discovery. They refused to allow cross-examination of Orsted's witnesses as required by the New Jersey Administrative Procedures Act. The BPU refused the demands of rate counsel for Ocean Wind to detail the cost of alternate routes for its transmission lines. The New Jersey Board of Public Utilities has issued multiple policy statements indicating that it is the lead agency to advance the offshore wind industrialization goals of New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. The governor has issued multiple executive orders instructing the Board of Public Utilities to carry out his directives with regard to wind energy. Board members of the BPU have called the BPU the partner of these big wind energy companies. Several members of the BPU have taken to wearing windmill turbine lapel pins. That's fine. Let them be the champions of the governor's wind energy policies. But they can't simultaneously be unbiased judges of petitions filed by wind companies. <laughs> Given this obvious bias, the county moved to disqualify the BPU and have the matter assigned to an administrative law judge. The BPU refused to recuse itself and refused to assign the matter to an ALJ. This request was also made by the Office of Rate Counsel and denied. In the end, the BPU pushed aside the duly elected officials of Cape May County and Ocean City, New Jersey, and effectively disenfranchised their voters. The BPU granted consent to Orsted's NJDP permit applications over the objections of Ocean City and Cape May County and effectuated a taking of real property from both Ocean City and Cape May County and transferred those interests to a foreign corporation. Ocean City has appealed the decision to the Appellate Division of the Superior Court in Cape May County is likely to appeal very shortly. But it is not only the destruction of home rule that concerns the Cape May County Board of Commissioners, Orsted's own information related to Ocean Wind One and published on their website indicates that only 85% of visitors to the Jersey Shore will return after windmills are installed 15 miles offshore. The Ocean Wind Two lease area will allow windmills to be installed within nine or 10 miles of the shore. A decline of 15% would be devastating to our economy. Cape May County draws visitors with its beaches and bays, its boardwalks and boating, but also with its many historic locations. These are all being ignored by the Bureau of o Ocean Energy Management. Both the BPU and BOEM seem to be ignoring a great number of negative impacts that appear likely to occur if these windmills are installed. Let's talk about tourism. Cape May County has a $7 billion tourism economy, billion with a B. A diminution of 15% of tourism, natural and, and historic resources, visitors, according to the Cape May County Department of Tourism, will result in a $993 million decrease in annual total visitor spending in Cape May County. $993 million. $414 million will be lost from the lodging sector. $229.4 million would be lost in the food and beverage sector. Retail would lose $189 million. Recreation spending would de decrease by $99 million. $62 million would be lost in the transportation sector. Even if you cut those impacts in half, it's devastating. We came through COVID, which shut down our stores in Cape May County, shut down our restaurants. We live and thrive on tourism. It's the lifeblood of our economy. It employs our families. It sustains hundreds of local small businesses. My first job, like so many people I know, was in a restaurant as a dishwasher at 13 years old. 
This is what we do. This is how we live. We survive only because of tourism. And we know how delicate tourism is. The difference between a family being able to pay the mortgage, pay the college tuition throughout the winter can literally depend on whether it is sunny or rainy on weekends in July. We cannot afford to get this wrong. Our economy, our culture, our very future is at stake. What we are dealing with in terms of the regulatory processes is a light speed, greased skids, fast tracked, ignore all the problems, get this done and get these things built. We don't care. That is happening on both the state and federal level. We encourage Congress to take a hard look at permitting reform that is pending before the Congress now because there are major giveaways to this industry within that bill. We think it's light speed now. When that's done, you won't even see it happening. The Board of County Commissioners of Cape May County respectfully urges Congress and the administration to take greater interest in local concerns. Who better to have input than the locals? Who better to have hearings such as this on these wind issues than the locals? And why did the New Jersey legislature rush a bill through in 10 business days when the locals were objecting? Because they don't want local opposition. They don't want to listen to op local opposition. That is why this is so important today. And we thank you. And we urge Congress to stay involved. I know you will. Do everything possible to reduce or eliminate the detrimental impacts of these projects to our fragile tourism economy and to restore home rule. Thank you. Judge Donahue yields, and we will hear from Daniel Lavecchia, and he has remarks he is a private businessman that is going to be affected by this process. Mr. Lavecchia. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Good afternoon, Congressman Van Drew, Congressman Smith, Congressman Harris, and Congressman Perry. Um, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> My name is Daniel Levecki. I'm president of La Monica Fine Foods. We're a vertically integrated seafood company that harvests and processes surf clams. Okay. All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> Along with my brother Michael, our business has been in New Jersey for three generations, and our fishing and processing operations employ over 200 people. It was started by my grandfather in 1923, and I'm proud to say that this year marks our 100-year anniversary. Thank you. Supplying commercial clams to major global food companies. It was at least five years ago that public outreach meetings were regularly held by the Bureau of Energy, Ma Energy Management, state agencies, and the wind development companies, all looking to advance their agenda of developing offshore wind energy as a solution to climate change. The commercial fishing industry was invited to participate and did so in a good faith effort to help develop a plan whereby the commercial fishing industry could coexist with offshore wind energy. The clam industry consistently stressed that clam vessels operating mobile bottom dredges would require a minimum distance between the vertical structures in an array of two nautical miles between turbines, placed in straight rows and columns and positioned in line with offshore currents. With our spatial recommendations, clam vessels could harvest clams within the array with few limitations. The clam industry insisted that this spatial configuration of wind turbines was vital to the coexistence of offshore wind and our safe continued fishing operations. While our recommendations were always welcome, no assurances were ever made to the industry. As we now see with the development of several lease sites embraced by many states, our recommendations solicited by BOEM and the wind energy companies were completely ignored. 
with total disregard for our recommendations, the construction and operation plans for wind energy areas today are all following a template where wind turbines are one nautical mile apart or less. If the wind energy areas are built as stated, clamming vessels will certainly be excluded from these sustainable and historical clamming grounds. There's an area off Atlantic City measuring 100 square nautical miles that historically represents the most productive and sustaining clamming grounds in the mid-Atlantic region. When Bohm leased these areas, there was no consideration for the commercial fishing industry and our communities that have fished and prospered in, in these areas for decades. In addition, the industry's recommendation for safe transit lanes between wind and energy areas has also fallen on deaf ears. Transit lanes have not been established between two wind energy areas leased off Atlantic City, which are continue, contiguous, abutting each other. Transiting through the wind energy area is in doubt, which means commercial vessels will have to navigate around their former clamming areas in search of new grounds. The absence of a transit lane will result in increased fishing and travel times, as well as much greater use and cost of fuel. Less product will be landed at the docks, resulting in less income for fishermen, less productivity at the plants, and very possibly the loss of commercial clamming off of New Jersey. Thousands of jobs could be lost across the industry, resulting in a decrease in the food supply, higher prices to the consumer for all seafood products. The sustainability of commercial fisheries is becoming collateral damage, resulting from the development of offshore wind energy because the developers and BOEM ignored the recommendations from the commercial sector on how both industries could coexist in the ocean. It is the Bureau of Energy Management's responsibility and obligation to consider all the stakeholders that use these waters as their livelihoods and build in provisions for those stakeholders that will be displaced. Congress needs to act to ensure that commercial fishermen can continue to work with minimal impact to sustain jobs and to continue to supply the nation with one of its most enjoyed proteins. Thank you for the opportunity to express my views representing the clam industry. Next, we are going to have Megan La <laughs> I am going to kill this microphone when we're done. Um, Megan, it's your show. And again, I will remind everybody, and I'm so sorry, to try to keep to about five, seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Megan Lapp, and I am the fisheries liaison for Seafreeze, a Rhode Island commercial fishing company. We own five federally permitted commercial fishing vessels and two shoreside facilities. Offshore wind is the single greatest threat to U.S. commercial fishing, and we are facing annihilation at the hands of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Over the past eight years, I have spent countless hours attending BOEM meetings, state meetings, workshops, webinars, stakeholder phone calls, developer meetings, writing hundreds of pages of comments, reading thousands of pages of materials, and meeting with elected and appointed officials to raise the issues I testify about today. BOEM has stonewalled and forced us into litigation as our only recourse. Right now, BOEM has leased 28 leases, totaling over 2.3 million acres of the East Coast, with plans to soon lease another 1.7 million acres. One wind energy area off the coast of Rhode Island is larger than the state itself. These leases are sited on top of extremely productive, historic commercial fishing grounds and important vessel transit routes. As the seventh most regulated industry in the nation, the fishing industry is not legally able to just relocate our vessel activity to accommodate offshore wind development. Our vessels will not be able to safely operate in a wind farm. BOEM documents acknowledge this fact. For example, one document states, some fisheries may not be able to safely operate and harvest the resource in the wind area. In this situation, a large portion of annual income for vessels may be inaccessible during operations. The BOEM record of decision approving that offshore wind farm stated, it is likely that the entire area will be abandoned by commercial fisheries due to difficulties with navigation. Yet BOEM has refused to deconflict fishing grounds at the outset of its leasing process. Prior to leasing what is now Empire Wind, I provided BOEM with confidential data from over 20 commercial fishing vessels in the lease area and requested that BOEM relocate the site prior to leasing. 
This was also suggested by NOAA Fisheries and U.S. Senators due to fisheries conflicts. Bohm refused. Rather, in April 2016, prior to lease sale, Bohm Director Hopper announced at a New York Task Force meeting that I'm not a marine biologist, but I'm a history maker, and proceeded to speak about how Bohm and New York would make history with the first New York wind farm. Radar interference from offshore wind turbines is also a major safety problem for our vessels, making transit in the fog, dark, or inclement weather impossible inside a wind farm. Marine navigation without reliable radar is a life-threatening situation. In 2018, I went to Coast Guard headquarters to discuss this issue with the Chief of the Office of Navigation Systems. As I placed several offshore wind radar interfer interference studies on the table, the captain was shocked, completely unaware of the issue. Upon leaving that meeting, when we asked what should our next steps be, Coast Guard personnel responded, we don't know what to tell you, this is literally the first we've heard of this. That is horrifying. In 2019, the Coast Guard conducted a port access route study off the coast of Massachusetts and Rhode Island regarding offshore wind. In multiple comments, I asked for the Coast Guard to investigate and analyze marine radar interference as part of that study. The Coast Guard response was that they were not aware of an authoritative scientific study that confirms or refutes the concern that wind turbines will degrade marine radar, despite a radar interference modeling study that the Coast Guard itself had conducted on Cape Wind in 2009. Notably, Coast Guard staff in charge of the Massachusetts Rhode Island PARS left the agency prior to the finalization of that study to become the head of marine affairs for a prominent offshore wind company holding multiple leases in the area of analysis. In 2022, the National Academy of Sciences released a report entitled Wind Turbine Generator Impacts to Marine Vessel Radar, confirming years of issues I had raised to Boehm and the Coast Guard and quoting part of my Coast Guard comment submissions. The study identified areas of potential future research, but no immediate solutions. In 2019, the Coast Guard had admitted that any analysis of radar interference was left to the wind developer and that it had not conducted any evaluation of radar interference on its own operation or search and rescue capabilities. The fact is that search and rescue, a core mission of the United States Coast Guard, will be compromised, but without any analysis on what this will mean for U.S. mariners. Bohm's response has been to approve projects anyway, leaving analysis and solutions to developers after construction, despite a legislative mandate to provide for safety. The result will be a grand experiment using the lives of U.S. mariners as the subjects. Approving projects without comprehensive solutions prior to construction is beyond irresponsible. Throughout my interaction with Bohm in what cannot even be called a process, Bohm has assured the fishing industry that our interests would be taken into consideration at the end. But by this stage, it is too late, and Bohm has already designed the scope of its project review to exclude any such consideration and accommodation. Bohm states that the purpose and need for their review is to meet the goals of the developer, state energy targets, and to fulfill the speculative power purchase agreements between the developer and state utilities signed prior to federal project review. For example, Bohm refuses to consider or analyze no-build areas to accommodate commercial fisheries already operating in these areas or transit lanes to accommodate safe transit through the wind energy areas because to do so would reduce the size of the project and make the developer unable to fulfill the previously signed power purchase agreement. In effect, this makes Bohm a third party to a private contract. And Bohm allows that private contract to override all legislative requirements, public duties, and interests of all other ocean uses. A federal process designed to regulate offshore wind cannot be subjugated to a speculative private contract or state legislation. The problem is Bohm. Bohm overrides cooperating agencies and heralds itself as the lead agency for offshore wind no matter what the subject. This is inappropriate and has led Boehm to ignore past Coast Guard safety advice, as well as population level impacts detailed by NOAA fisheries on our nation's natural resources, including critically endangered species and commercially important fish stocks. Boehm analysis is so rushed and incomplete as the agency accelerates offshore wind review that its documents no longer even make any sense. For example, as I reviewed Bohm analysis on a project recently out for public comment, the conclusion that Bohm reached was that there would be no differences in impacts to the benthic ocean floor environment from pile driving 94 turbines and trenching 300 miles of cables into the ocean floor or from not building the project at all. The reality is that nobody in the U.S. government is at the helm actually critically regulating any of this activity. There is no independent analysis occurring.
there is no oversight in what appears to be a textbook definition of regulatory capture. In reality and in practice, the offshore wind developers are at the helm. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Megan Lapp yields, and we will ask David Stevenson for his remarks. It was on for a second. <laughs> I have to keep an eye on it. Yeah, it's going to do it to you. This, it's, I think it, not this thing. Uh, despite flickering microphones and flickering lights, you are supplying daylight to what this situation is, and we appreciate it. And I thank my fellow panelists. We're all shedding light on this, and the things that they are calling major negative impacts, BOEM also calls them major negative impacts, ignores them in approved projects anyway. So I want to let you know, I grew up in South Jersey. I got my economics degree from Rutgers University, and I've used it in multiple careers over the last 50 plus years. Tells you how old I am. Uh, I spent many a vacation and uh, uh, weekend at the Jersey Shore, love it here. One of my best weekends ever was at Wildwood, and man, thank you for that weekend. <laughs> we better not hear the details. It wasn't that bad. Okay, Ec economics is some kind, sometimes called the dismal science, and I do have bad news for you today. Uh, but I will finish up with some positive news. Uh, much of the data I'm sharing with you uh, is from the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, final approval documents uh, for the three offshore wind projects that have been approved. From these documents, it's really easy to do the calculations. It, it doesn't take a lot of science. So, let, uh, yes, we'll try to get this right. Uh, so what I'm going to show you is the, aver the real average cost of what these projects are. And it's not, hard to find, it's not easy to find that data. Representative Harris, if you're in, uh, in Maryland, the utility gives the information in 2012 dollars, rather than uh, it's going to be opened up in 2026. So here's, the, here's some of the numbers. The average premium cost to residents uh, electric customers you'll actually see on your bills will total about $100 per year just for these uh, first three projects. If you add that up over 20 years, which is the project life, you're talking about a $2,000 commitment from every household. Uh, the average industrial customer will see a $100,000 cost a year and up to $2 million over 20 years. Governor Murphy plans to triple the size of these programs. That means for an average annual household, they're going to commit you to $6,000 of investment for offshore wind. The cost to New Jersey in terms of economic benefits is going to be almost $14 billion. About $9 billion of that is from electric premiums. The rest is from federal tax credits. Uh, the benefits, by the way, are only about $2 billion. So you're looking at six times the cost as the benefits. You will not hear this from the Utility Commission. Of course, this uh, doubles if you count secondary benefits and triples again if we do the 11,000 megawatts that Governor Murphy wants. Add it all up, you're looking at $80 billion in cost over the next 20 years. And these cost estimates do not include what you've heard from uh, the loss of tourism and commercial fishing. I didn't include that. So the, uh, the primary reason to build these is to save carbon dioxide emissions. The utility commissions say it's going to be 7 million metric tons of savings. It's really, a, it's really wrong. At best, it's going to be half that amount and possibly zero. I won't go into all the details other than that uh, basically a quarter of this uh, replacement is going to be replacement for the closed clean energy Oyster Creek atomic plant. And they used the wrong numbers when they talked about reducing imports. 
So the second part of this is about what the developers are looking at in, as far as headwinds. It is likely 97% of the approved project capacity on the entire East Coast is priced too low to attract financing to get these things built. And our, a number of the developers are already asking for more money from the, from the utility commissions and state governments up and down the coast. Uh, in March of 2022, the U.S. Energy Information Agency estimated the project coming online would need levelized revenue of $105 per, per megawatt hour. The, uh, almost all of the projects on the East Coast are way below that. Uh, uh, Ocean Wind 1 is $98. And as we speak, uh, the new numbers are coming out from EIA and it will probably be more like 115 And that doesn't include decommissioning costs. If you throw that in, you're up to about probably $130. And this one's priced at 98. They're going to be asking for a lot more money, folks. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to look at the path forward a little bit. Here's my summary. Ocean wind is the most expensive choice to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from the electric grid. Ex existing projects off the coast of Rhode Island and Virginia show offshore wind. Uh, power generation occurs mostly in the spring and fall when electric demand is at its lowest. Uh, New York State has, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, grid manager in New York State is actually saying that they're going to have to turn those turbines off uh, at times because they're going to produce more energy than they're needed. That's not been included in any calculations. And finally, I have read, probably more than anybody else in this room, uh, five different environmental impact statements, analyzed them, and wrote public uh, 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 comments. My opinion is offshore wind is an environmental wrecking ball. And you've heard some of the details over here. <laughs> Finally, there's a, there's a vision here for a better outcome. Instead of renegotiating guaranteed prices for the, for the uh, developers, it, I recommend New Jersey consider starting over with new solicitations. And that should include any type of power generation source that reduces carbon dioxide emissions. It could... So that could include solar, that could include nuclear. Uh, you may not know it, but the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has just approved the very first a um, uh, developer, a builder of uh, re uh, small modular reactors is New, uh, New Scale in Camden, New Jersey. <laughs> Instead of $15 billion in offshore wind and only get $2 billion of it back in New Jersey, building that, those reactors would cost less uh, and uh, all of the money would stay in New Jersey. So that is a big deal. A Utah project for New Scale was just approved, and it's cheaper than the offshore wind projects, by the way. We can also, we can also do carbon capture. There is uh, work going on around the country. Uh, Deer Park, Texas, there is a natural gas power plant that may uh, wind up saving 5 million tons of carbon dioxide, which is almost as much as uh, is, is planned for the entire state from these offshore wind projects. So I would sum up here. Do New Jersey families really want to pay $2,000 or $6,000 to subsidize offshore wind that will spoil the beautiful Jersey shore and the environment when better solutions exist? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Um, we're now going to proceed under the five-minute rule, and we will stick with it with questions. And I recognize myself first. Now, for, again, the folks out there that haven't seen a hearing, this is the time when the congressman asks the questions to all of the members here or some of the panel, whomever they decide. And uh, so I will 
begin myself. And I guess the first question I have, a lot of people don't know about this. I, I believe it was found under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and Sean Hayes, who's the chief of protected species, uh, sent a letter to Brian Hooker, evidently, uh, also in, both from Baum. And the lead biologist at Baum warned of long-term impacts to right whales. This is their own agency, and they wouldn't release it. We, we actually had to get it under the Freedom of Information Act, but that there would be long-term danger and impacts to these whales. Um, their own scientists warned Baum that offshore wind will severely impact the whales yet they've just moved ahead and completely ignored even the few good people in their own group that would tell the truth. By the way, when I sum up, I'm going to discuss this. There's been a lack of not, there's been a lot of not telling the truth going on, let me tell you. Um, so we, we led a letter to Baum demanding answers and to have them explain why the agency did this, because it makes no sense, because if my people come to me and say, this is a real problem, you got to do something, you should go do it. So, Megan, I know you know a little bit about this. Would you tell us just any thoughts you have on that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Congressman. Um, so that letter was specific to an area off the coast of Massachusetts, which is the only known winter foraging ground for the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. And there are already wind leases um, and projects um, cited in this area. And what NOAA Fisheries was saying is that there's peer-reviewed science that shows that when you have large-scale offshore wind farms, it essentially sucks the wind out of the air, which changes the, di the dynamic of the ocean. Um, one study in the North Sea showed a 10% decrease in primary productivity inside and adjacent to the wind farm. So if a wind farm is put on the area, which is the only known winter foraging ground for right whales, and it decreases the primary productivity of that area for the whole life of the project, meaning that now there's no food for the whales, you have a critically endangered species with nothing to eat in the winter time. And so, interestingly enough, that particular area, before it was leased, Boehm actually had a section on a chart saying, well, maybe we should exclude this from leasing because of right whales. And they didn't um, exclude it. They went ahead and leased it anyway. So now you have projects cited on it. Um, I have not seen a chart of what NOAA is proposing as far as um, where exactly the boundaries of that exclusion zone that they're proposing would be, but it sure would be interesting to see it. Thank you, Mrs. Lapp, and we, I request this be put in the public record, um, and, and we, um, without objection, without objection, that's what I wanted to say, because something else came on my mind. Mr. Levecchia, I've known you a long time, in, in, in a good way, you're a good man, you're a good businessman, but t do you, I know there are, there are people here who remember, um, years ago, I've been fighting this fight for a long time trying to help the fishermen, trying to help a lot of people. And so I met with Baum, and then we had a hearing, but it wasn't a real congressional hearing like this, but we did have a hearing, about 150 people there, and I spoke to them, and I had spoken to them before the hearing, probably a year before, and I said, will you promise me that you will speak at least to these fishermen and to some of these other people in our community that have issues. Let's see if we can work something out and at least try to make it better. They promised me. And I'm going to be blunt. You guys know me, a lot of you. I'm rough around the edges. They lied. They lied. And we caught them in the lie. You know we caught them in the lie? Because we had them come to a meeting that we had that was a little smaller than this, I have to admit, but still about 150 people. And I asked all the fishermen and other people that were there, some environmentalists, other people, I said, now, Baum has promised me, not Baum, I'm sorry, that was, it was not Baum, it was Orsted. It was Orsted, so let me correct that. Orsted has promised me that they would speak to all of you and work it out, that they could do this thing. So I asked, and Orsted told me they had done that. Don't worry, Jeff, you don't need the hearing, no big deal, we've worked it out. 
we had the hearing, we had the meeting, so I did the simple thing. The only way I know what to do, I said, raise your hand if, you know, Orsted has spoken to you and if they've helped in any way. About 150 people there, three people raised their hand, all three worked for Orsted. <laughs> True story. They don't even tell the truth. They don't care. I don't know, again, your experience as a businessman, did they make any real concessions? Did they help you in any way for real, sincerely? Not just the talk, but did they walk the walk at all? Congressman Van Drew, thank you um, for the question. They, we've met with them many times, uh, with Orsted and many other developers, and have suggested numerous remedies that would help us. They leave the room, they never get back to us, they say they're gonna have more meetings, uh, they're gonna have monthly meetings or quarterly meetings, uh, and it's true of all of them. They, they never really get back to us. Uh, we've asked for two nautical miles spacing, they've come back with one mile, 1 1.6 mile. They know we can't fish in those arrays in under two miles. We've they didn't do it. This is off again. Last thing I'm going to say, remember this is not an American company. Just remember over half of your energy is going to be controlled outside the United States of America. Think about that. Think about that. Okay, I am going to, I am going to yield and I'm going to ask Congressman Smith for his minutes of questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Unbelievable testimony, brilliant. Uh, no other word describes it, I think. Uh, where are the hearings by the New Jersey State Assembly and State Senate probing this? Why in 10 days did they pass that amendment that, that a coercive power of the state manifestation so that you have no say? I mean, those who did that need to be held to account. Maybe they can reverse it somehow, but I, I am just, it's amazing. You know, we're all grateful when our favorite quarterback for our favorite team hides the ball. Well, we've been seeing the ball hid by our governor and by our president in a way that is unconscionable. Where is the transparency? Not only are the lives of, of the entire ecosystem, all of those, those unbelievably wonderful uh, sea creatures, large and small, at risk, we have a situation where they have just looked the other way. You know, one thing about groups, uh, government bureaucrats and, and scientists, even those who purport to be independent, I, am, I hate groupthink. When you get a group of scientists, uh, the first amendment I offered as a member of Congress was to, to give service connection disability for those who suffered from Agent Orange. It failed. Pentagon said dioxin, which is the, the hazard embedded in Agent Orange, the defoliant, um, it was not proved. It was, you know, it, it, don't look here. They hid the ball for 10 years. 20 years later, I wrote the law on Persian Gulf mystery illness. And when I had the hearings, and I chaired them, I had the Pentagon telling me that it's just mass anxiety. 500,000 people suffering uh, all kinds of autoimmune symptoms. Uh, we got the bill passed. It was signed into law. But there was never an acknowledgment that it wasn't anxiety. People who were never deployed to the Persian Gulf had the exact same thing. Uh, it was probably, you know, the vaccinations that went out uh, that caused it. Uh, so groupthink is something that I'm so concerned about happening right now. All the scientists. And, uh, and then they, you know, if anybody speaks out of turn, Good luck, you're gonna lose your job. And, and good luck getting published or anything else in the future. Real quick on the questions. Uh, I have many, but I don't have that much time. You know, thank you, Ms. Laff, for pointing out that even the Coast Guard has that revolving door where people who are vested with the power and the authority and responsibility to call it the way it is, all of a sudden they're out the door and working uh, for the opposition, in this case, the wind power corporations. Thank you for that. I also want to thank you for, I read your testimony and immediately downloaded this National Academy of Sciences report, read it from cover to cover, and I was shocked that even this report, 2022, says they don't have any mitigating uh, uh, efforts that are bearing any fruit on the issue of radar. So potentially we will have all of these vessels at risk 
of colliding with one another or with stationary uh, objects that are out there, uh, including maybe these 1,000-foot poles. Uh, and, and where is the concern about that? I don't find it anywhere. We still, and maybe somebody wants to speak to the issue of hurricanes. I mean, we're in hurricane, they start, obviously, in Africa, make their way to the Caribbean, work up our coast. Where in any of the uh, environmental impact statements do they seriously look at the damage of a possible hurricane? I was a paper boy when, 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 um, uh, when the Hurricane Donna hit. Uh, for the Perth Amboy Evening News, I'll never forget it. Category 3, when it hit Long Island. We're told that Category 3s will topple these things like, like, like I said earlier, like dominoes. So if you want to speak to that, I'd appreciate it. But this whole idea of secrecy will be attacked today by the governor or his people, uh, and they'll all say, there's no evidence. You're not even looking. And that's the problem I find so appalling in all of this. Almost out of time. So any of you would like to uh, speak to it, please do. The governor should be here talking to us. Hold him to account as well. Cindy, or anybody would like to speak to that? Yes, please go Thank you, Mr. Um, to, your, to your point about the hurricanes, actually, for the Central Atlantic call areas, which um, it's like about 1.7 million acres now from about Cape May to Cape Hatteras, outside of the leases that are already existing, um, I actually asked Boehm to overlay the past 30 years of hurricane tracks on top of the lease areas and, and to do some analysis. Of course, they didn't, so I went to NOAA's hurricane tracking site and I looked them up. And I can tell you that there is quite a bit of overlap, um, quite a bit. And, and you can look at which ones are categories one, two, three, four, five, and, and it's right over those areas. Um, to your point that, you know, that nobody is looking at these really, really important issues. There, even in those areas, NASA has said that these areas interfere with all their missions out of Wallops Island. The Navy has said there is not an area in that whole, that whole lease block um, that does not interfere with DOD missions. But Boehm is continuing ahead. And when I've asked them on webinars, well, like the Navy said that this is a problem. How can you still be leasing it? They're like, oh, well, we're just going to continue, continue the discussions. There's a lot of discussions. There's a lot of meetings. But there is never anything actionable where something is denied. And that is a huge, huge problem that hopefully um, Congress can help with. Thank you. If I could yeah. to the conversation about the concern with the radar. We, are, we have the number one port on the East Coast where we are moving a lot of cargo, but included in that cargo are oil tankers and chemical tankers. And if one of those ships were to have a collision with a ship or with the monopole or with the transmission facilities, it would be catastrophic to our coast. And so you're talking about no radar, fog, storm activity. It's not a good combination. I just would add that. Thank you. Th we 30 seconds. Real, real quick, uh, just to amplify on the, uh, the defense issue, uh, the first half of the site off LBI from about 9 to 14 miles out is labeled by the Navy as a DOD exclusion zone. We tried to contact DOD to find out what that means. We could not get any information. Maybe it's classified, I don't know. But right now, you have a lease area out there, half of which is classified as a DOD exclusion zone. And as Megan indicates, all you get from Bohm is, well, we're working it out with DOD. I'd rather hear something from DOD before. Thank you. All right, next, we have... Next, we have Congressman Dr. Harris. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Drew. Um, Mr. Stevenson, by the way, I'm very glad you mentioned small nuclear reactors, because those are really the future of, uh, of zero carbon energy. I mean, it's, it, that's... <laughs> so I don't know why we don't have discussions of that, why we're, still discuss why we're still discussing a technology that's literally centuries old. I mean, windmills are centuries old technology. Shouldn't even be talking about it. I'm glad you mentioned decommissioning costs. 
very infrequently uh, calculated into it. We have a little town down in uh, the bottom of my district built one windmill to power its uh, sewer plant. It failed because this wind doesn't blow enough. They can't, they don't have the money to take it down because nobody counts on decommissioning. Uh, Ms. Lapp, uh, with regard to Boehm, Director Hooper's comment about, uh, you know, we're going to make history, look, the fix was in. That's the bottom line. That's what all this testimony is, is the fix was in. Mr. Lavecchia, that's why they, they're not uh, uh, acquiescing to your requests, because the fix was in from the moment you met with them. Judge Donahue, they don't want the county of Cape May or the city of Ocean City to protest because the fix is in in the legislatures. That's the bottom line. Now, Dr. Stern, I, I have a copy of your letter to the president and the, the material that's attached to it, which is incredibly important because it seems at every turn the regulators chose the most benign prediction at every single turn. I mean, there'd be a range of predictions. They choose the most benign. And when you add that up, the cumulative effect is the fix was in, and they wanted to come to a conclusion, which is never the way unless you have, as Megan, as you pointed out, a captured regulatory uh, function. That never should be the way it operates. Let me ask you a question, a scientific question, which you brought up. Does anybody know what the long-term effect of, the, uh, of that Vesta 919 feet tall windmill is in an ocean environment? Because my understanding is the prototype is built on land. It's never been put in the ocean. Your, t your uh, testimony suggests that this is kind of common sense. The larger the windmill, the more noise it makes. Does anybody know the long-term effect? Before we put these in the ocean? Before we put these in the ocean? You got it? There has been not a single one of these turbines placed anywhere around the world so one could take some measurements and see what the actual noise is. Uh, to me, that's just not the way to proceed. Uh, when we operated at the energy department, we would never roll out this without first doing some pilot projects, a demonstration project. Then you do a commercial size demonstration project, and if everything pans out, then you could move forward. No, th no thank you very much, because I only have a limited amount of time. You're absolutely right. We should have done, we should have done that. Because we have to know the effective behavior of that sound. I'll just tell you a little story. We had a little dog. I live in, in Cambridge, Maryland. It's near the water. A uh, fireworks come on 4th of July, a little dog gets away from its owner, here's the sound, anybody even know who have dogs and fireworks, you know what they do, right? They run. The dog runs right into the creek, drowns. Now if you get that dog out of the water, you declare its cause of death to be drowning. No, no, no. The cause of its death was a firework and its behavioral response to that event. That's what's happening here. Now, Ms. Zip, and just to close out my time, because it hasn't been mentioned yet, and Dr. Van Drew should realize this, you know, whenever we open an ampule of a sterilized substance, whether you're doing a dentist office, I'm doing an operating room, it has been tested against a substance called, and I always have to write this down, the, it's a limulus amoebocyte lysate test derived from the horseshoe crab. These horseshoe crabs, if you look at a map, it's southern New Jersey and it's Delaware. Now, Ms. Ziff, my understanding is they have to run how many miles of, of cable between these, uh, between these windmills. Electricity running through a cable, everybody remember your physics class, creates an electromagnetic field. It is completely unknown what the effect of that electromagnetic field is going to be on the migration of the horseshoe crabs on shore to lay their eggs and to propagate in order to keep our medicine safe. Our, when, I, when I wrote, when I informed uh, Secretary Azar, the previous uh, administra uh, Secretary of Health, of Health and Human Services, he wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Department of Interior saying you have to investigate this before you lay these cables under the, on the Atlantic Ocean floor because of how serious it is to the health of our nation. And the Department of Interior in this administration disregarded the letter. 
This is exactly contrary to what the uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is supposed to do, which is to take all agencies' inputs into account. The fix was in, and it's going to endanger our lives. Ms. Ziff, can you just comment briefly if you know about the effect on horseshoe crabs? I, I specifically don't, but I know many, um, many who do. And I know that um, every one of us depends on the health of that horseshoe crab and that there's an important habitat that's in the area for all of these wind turbines. And I think I want to um, emphasize something that I believe you said earlier. Whales and marine life, they don't know boundaries. And, you know, we are creating and we are destroying and, and networking a vast power plant in the ocean and turning it into a power plant, which will have catastrophic impacts that we, they don't even know. And I think your points are well taken. I appreciate them. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Drew. I yield back. He's a pretty smart guy, isn't he? <laughs> um, and our last speaker up here, and then we're going to have closing statements if necessary, um, and I think they will be. Uh, Congressman Perry. Thank you, Chairman uh, Van Drew. Uh, Mr. Donahue, uh, I, I agree with, with the gentleman up here so far that the fix is in it. It does appear for those of us who only get to come to the Jersey Shore, and it's a wonderful pleasure for us to get to do this a little bit of time, maybe once or twice a year, but it, it does appear that, that uh, private entities, including some foreign entities, are working with state government officials and federal government officials to make this happen uh, despite what the residents of the state desire. What, what is, if you know, and maybe you don't, but I don't, what is New Jersey's, what, what is a coastal state's authority how far out does it go? What, what say does, does the state of New Jersey have with its coastal waters in the ocean and what gets placed there? Uh, it's a complex question. As I understand it, the, the three mile limit before you hit clearly federal waters is usually what we understand around here. Three miles. You can't bring those big striped bass back in that you catch five miles out. Um, the way that I understand the construct of this uh, wind energy approach is that the federal government through BOEM has identified these areas and they've given the states the authority to do solicitations and oversee these projects. This is a question I've asked all along, is we have state authorities overseeing foreign corporations building power plants in federal waters. And I've never understood how that can work. Well, it seems like the state's getting all of the downside and none of the upside, right? The residents aren't getting any of the upside here. Um, to Mrs. Mrs. Zip and, and Dr. Stern, the rest of us, look, it, it appears the other thing I've determined while I'm sitting here is this has been going on for some time here for the folks in New Jersey, but for the rest of us, we wouldn't know about this, quite honestly, if it weren't for these whales washing up on the beach, right? And the, and the animals washing. So we wouldn't even know about it, right? So is, is this normal? Is it normal what we're seeing? Because we don't think it is, but we don't know. We don't live here. And has anybody told you why it's happening? No. Turn your mic on, Done. sir. All right. No, this is very unusual. Uh, the number of whale strandings, as I mentioned, nine of the Jersey coast in three months, when the average over the last 20 years, I think, is seven a year. A year, right? So, so you've got nine in three months, average seven in a year. But getting to your point about the state authority, the state does have a significant role here, even though it's a federal project offshore. There is a provision in the Coastal Zone Management Act. The state must find that the project is consistent with the coastal zone management rules, this New Jersey's coastal zone management. And we looked at the provisions in the coastal zone management rules, and they are replete with nice words about visual resource protection, endangered species protection, a job loss protection in the tourism industry, and so on and so forth. And we commented extensively to the DEP, like, how are you going to find this project consistent? So the state does not bring up that provision. 
but they have a significant Sh shouldn't there decision be, I mean, to make if you got, here if you got these, on that. You don't know what's causing the death of the animals. They're washing up on your shore. We're all watching it. We also know that, because we've heard, right, even though you're not here, you hear that there's this testing going on right offshore where the whales, mammals are migrating and live and exist and so on and so forth. Has, has, has the state moved to stop, even for a moment, any of the action to at least find out what's going on? No, if I, if I could, Congressman, they have not, and dozens of elected officials, including Congressman Van Drew, have asked for that to happen. We held a forum last night with about 500 people or so in Ocean City. What we're told is we don't know why there are more vessel strikes and more whales washing up dead on the beach, but we know with absolute certainty it has nothing to do with the wind farms. And how did they prove that? And they, they haven't. Within, within days of the, of the uh, press conference that we had when whale number six washed up in Atlantic City, um, the federal agencies put together a, hastily, um, a hasty press conference to deny, deny, deny. And there is no evidence. And yet, I, as I stated, the National Marine Fisheries Service says specifically that, these, that this activity can harm whales through vessel strikes right. and other impacts. So they admit on the one hand that it could, but they don't want to investigate whether or not these activities did. Mr. Chairman, if you'll indulge one more question, I know my time's expired. We all want clean water. We all want the best for our environment, our towns, and so on and so forth. But to Mr. Stevenson, based on your background, are there better, more efficient, more effective alternatives to produce power for the state and the residents of New Jersey and these coastal towns than this offshore wind that is being proposed and jammed down your throats? Yes, there's any number of better I yield ways. the balance. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman, and Congressman Perry yields back. Um, and I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes, a little housekeeping, then any last thoughts. First of all, I want to thank the panel. You were all wonderful. Were they great? <laughs> we were really careful to choose people who knew their stuff. I had no hand in choosing any of them. It was all done by the staff to make sure nobody could say these were friends or people that were politically involved or anything else. Just really good people that wanted to speak and are very, very, very knowledgeable about this issue. Thank you all. I appreciate it. We all appreciate it. I want to thank our congressman. Uh, congressman Perry, what, how many hours did you drive? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know that he's taking a dip in the ocean today, though. I don't know. I'll see. Uh, Congressman Smith, always for his diligence, his hard work, and the good job that he does. Um, our doctor that came all the way from Maryland, and he actually got to go, he got to go on the ferry. Is that your first time? First time on the ferry, so he enjoyed that. And again, a lot of his time. Um, Congress people are very, very busy. And to get three people to come out on an issue like this um, is something that we all appreciate. There can be good government. There can be good government. And there are good guys. Now let me tell you a couple things, and they may not like it, and again, once in a while I'm a little rough around the edges, but I'm just gonna say, you know, Bohm may not like it, and the BPU may not like it, and certainly, uh, you know, the companies are not going to like it. Orsted's not going to like it. Atlantic Shores is not going to like it. But this is not the last hearing. I'm telling you right now. We, we, are, not, we are not giving up on this. You know, and there's so many things involved here when I think of about not only the science of it and the effect on the environment, but the effect on tourism that was talked about, the effect on our own health, which was spoken about, the effect on the cost. You know what? There's a lot of people making it paycheck to paycheck, and when they find out what this is going to cost to have this energy and how expensive it's going to be and how many times it's not going to be functional because we haven't been told the truth, 
truth, we're going to stand up. We've got to stand up as Americans and say it isn't right. And I'll tell you, you know, just a few thoughts I wanted to share. There are so many things that are wrong in what happened here. What, you know, Michael Donahue, Judge Donahue spoke about. Imagine you live in a town and you're told that the legislature is going to meet and you can no longer do your own zoning. Is this America? Is this the America we know and love? Come on. It's wrong. That was wrong. I think it's unconstitutional. I don't think it's the right thing. And we've got to fight it. So we have the classic case of big companies joining with big government, colluding together. You know, they like to use that word collusion. This is collusion. Colluding together, working together, not telling the truth, not caring about our health, our environment, our jobs, our tourism, our economy, our future, our children, our grandchildren. Damn it, that is unacceptable. So, our next hearing is going to be in Washington, D.C. and We've got to work through that. It's going to be a little more complicated. Of course, we'll figure it out some way. Usually, we don't have these many people at congressional hearings, but we'll figure something out, and we're going to do more here as well. We're not going to give up. And, you know, people say to me, Can we, are we going to win this? I, we've got to win it. It's our responsibility. Nobody's saying that we have a lock on it, but boy, God help us if we don't try, and we're going to try like there's no tomorrow. And, uh, closing remarks. Thank you very much. First of all, Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling this hearing. For assembling an amazing group of people who brought different aspects to light uh, with tremendous amount of analysis and wisdom. Thank you all for your testimonies. Uh, let me just say too, you know, we talk about this ordeal and it is an ordeal, uh, but we're only in the beginning phases. That's why we have to stop it now. You know, the next one will be construction and we know what that will do to the habitat and as well as the, the noise. Then comes 20 to 25 years of having these monstrosities out there in the ocean. And then decommissioning. You know, Dr. Harris talked a moment ago about one decommissioning that has gone awry. Imagine taking down or doing whatever they're going to do to 3,400 or so of these huge poles and everything else. And we don't even know if they'll last that long. I mean, talk about a scrap heap. What do you do with it? What do you do with the blades? They, you know, are they going into a landfill? Where are they going? Uh, all those questions have not been. So decommissioning uh, is, is a problem that they will leave for your kids and grandkids, which I, again, find appalling. I would invite and, and really appeal to the news media to start asking very hard questions of our governor at press conferences, wherever he is, and don't just get the answer that nothing to see here. <laughs> you know, there, there, there's, there's no connection between the whale deaths and, of course, these surveys that are going on. Uh, where's the science to back that up, uh, uh, governor? Follow the money. You know, a 30% tax credit, that's your money and mine, that's being spent, and they got to do it, of course, by January 1st, 2026, construction needs to begin. So that's why the hurry-up offense, which again means you make serious mistakes as you go on. And then finally, this is a cover-up in real time that we're experiencing. You know, there's no transparency. I asked the questions, Jeff asked the questions, we all asked the questions, and we get crickets. We don't get any kind of response, or we get a letter uh, that was written, and it's, it's meaningless what they tell us. So we do need, we're going to push our GAO report really aggressively. They have the power to really ferret out information, so that's going to be pushed. If we can't get it passed as a bill, because it would be vetoed by the president when it got to his desk, we can ask, and I've already asked, we've asked that the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee make that request with all of us signing on, and GAO will do, will do the report. And that will be a comprehensive government watchdog oversight of this egregiously flawed process. So thank you, and thank you all for coming, and um, we're going to win this. 
and I want to thank the Congressman for his legislation. And so you know, uh, we also have legislation that I sponsored, he's sponsoring with me uh, for a moratorium until we get this all fixed, figured out. <laughs> Dr. Harris. Thank you very much. And again, uh, Dr. Van Drew, thank you for putting this great group of uh, expert witnesses together. Uh, look, the bottom line is that uh, I sit on the Appropriations Committee. The, uh, the people in the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management have their salaries paid by the Appropriations Committee, and we're going to deal with them in this year's appropriations bills, let me tell you. I want to echo, echo Congressman Smith's call to the media, because when I reviewed, uh, when I reviewed the response of some of the media outlets, what they responded to the whale deaths was a word-for-word -word repetition of Orsted's press release. Literally word for word. And just to tell you how, how it, it creeps into everything, those of you who don't know, because on the horseshoe crab issue, there's actually a website called Return the Favor NJ, Return the Favor New Jersey, which is about preserving the horseshoe crabs off of New Jersey, okay? Funded by Orsted. You talk about Orwellian. I mean, they literally, again, return the favor, NJ, look it up. Go down to the bottom of the page, funded by Orsted. The company where we don't know the science about what this is going to do to these horseshoe crabs, just like we don't know the science of what 919-foot towers are going to do long-term to whales, this is what we, we have to have the media expose this. That's the, way, that's the way we're going to win this fight. I want to thank you again, Congressman Van Drew, and I yield back. Thank you, Doctor. And last, but certainly not. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you. Just do it. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to be with you a day down at the shore. Um, I would just say this: the, the media needs to do our job, but their job, but we need to do our job too. It seems to me that this company called Orsted. Uh, needs to be sitting in front of a congressional hearing. It seems to me that it, se it seems to me this Bureau of Ocean Energy Management or mismanagement needs to be hauled in and needs to spend them some time, uh, you know, in, in front of uh, uh, questioners answering some tough questions. Quite honestly, it also seems to me that your governor could stand a little questioning too. So we want to get to the bottom of it and. Uh, and we need to, pro you know, look, obviously we need to get to the bottom of it before construction starts. Um, and so we can't, this is a, unfortunately, the animals lost their lives, uh, but let's, let's make, uh, make sure that uh, we get, turn something good out of that and, uh, and make sure we don't make things absolutely much worse than, than they're going to be already. So God bless you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. God bless you.